This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Welcome to Glo Global Connections on ThinkTech. I'm your host today, Carol Mon Lee. Our show is called ISAS Conference and Dr. Kathleen Davis, and we're going to talk about the global perspectives on Anglo-Saxons and Anglo-Saxonisms from halfway around the world. The International Society of Anglo-Saxons 18th Biennial Meeting brings important scholars to Hawaii, and with the Pacific Biennial gives a different perspective on Anglo-Saxon studies. If you want to ask a question or participate in a, today's discussion, you can tweet us at ThinkTechHI or call us at 808-374-2014. Our guest for today is Dr. Kathleen Davis of the University of Rhode Island. Dr. Davis is in Hawaii to attend the conference, the International Society of Anglo-Saxonists, uh, taking place here at the University of Hawaii. She is invited as the Jerry H. Bentley Memorial Keynote Speaker and will speak on archipelago Pelagos of historiography. <laughs> Professor Davis is a skilled scholar of Anglo-Saxon and medieval English literature and has been described as a courageously committed dialogist of medieval and post-colonial studies. That's a mouthful. Welcome to the show, Dr. Davis. Thank it's so you. so nice to have Thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, so this is a really important conference for the state of Hawaii, and I know that uh, it's been in preparation for many months yep. and years. So why mm -hmm. don't you tell us a little bit about ISAS and what that stands for? Well, ISAS is the International Society of Anglo-Saxonists, um, so-called because it is for Anglo-Saxonists who are from all over the world. We have people from Japan, from all over Europe, of course, mainly, however, England and the United States. Um, Anglo-Saxonists, the study of Anglo-Saxon Anglo studies um, is uh, it focuses on anything to do with what's called the Anglo-Saxon period, something we would problematize, but um, which would be from about 500 to about 1100 mm -hmm. um, in England. Only England. Well, the, uh, yes, it's mainly England. It, there are connections to Germany and to lots of other areas because the people who moved into Britain Mm -hmm. um, say, you know, in the 5th and 6th centuries were from the mainland and many, you know, Germanic areas. So the North Sea is another way of imagining um, how to study this area and this time. Um, but there's a very interesting connection made here. In Hawaii. In Hawaii. Um, and uh, what Dr. Karen Jolly, who teaches here at the University of Hawaii, um, who is hosting, and the University of Hawaii is hosting very nicely, um, the, the conference, what Dr. Jolly wanted to do was open out Anglo-Saxon studies to a very different perspective. Um, make international mean something different altogether, right? Right. So, so the International Society meets, what, twice the, every other every year? Every other year. And yeah. typically the meetings have been in, in, in Europe, in Typically Europe, yes, moving around Europe and the United States. So this is the first time it's ever been in Hawaii or in the Pacific? I believe it is. Uh -huh. I have to check my history, but I know it's not been in Hawaii before, uh -huh. and I don't think it's been in the Pacific at all. Okay, and so again, let's talk again about why that is so important this time to have the conference here in Hawaii mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. what that means to the study and how mm -hmm. the influences from the Pacific um, might affect the ongoing interest of of mm -hmm. the many scholars who are here for this program. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, the background is that Anglo-Saxon studies um, has, first of all, tended to be a very conservative field in the past, although that is changing. Um, and also- Conservative in what way? In, in the sense of being very Eurocentric. Eurocentric, yes. yes. Very mm -hmm. Eurocentric. Um, and focused on um, issues that don't tend to open out on current dialogues today, whether that be, you know, this is in the past, not now. Things have changed drastically, but in the past, very focused on, well, very white, very male, um, very nationalist history. All right, so that's why Karen wanted to bring it here because. Um, for a long time, again, I want to emphasize, because I don't want my colleagues to get angry with me, in the past, this is where it's coming from. And great strides have been made, but not enough to 
fully open out onto the kind of global perspective, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, that is happening faster and faster today. Um, so the one thing is that it's been tied to nationalism. So Anglo-Saxon studies has been tied to nationalism and, and unfortunately today even things like white supremacy. No kidding. Yeah, yes, because um, white Anglo-Saxon is the uh, way people who consider wasps. themselves wasps, yeah. yes, very, very um, white power mm -hmm. um, would like to think of themselves quite often. That is um, the characterization. Um, okay. So, of course, that is not ever what the field was about, but it's more important than ever for this reason to educate people um, about, but also ourselves, about the history of the field and um, what the, what our own responsibilities to a field like this are. So because it has been, going back into the 18th and 19th centuries, a field that has been very much tied to nationalism, it is also very much tied to this, to colonialism, because disciplines that took shape, um, history, uh, religious studies, anthropology, um, literary studies, they all took, took their form and in the 18th and 19th centuries, different ones at different, you know, paces and uh, during that time. They tended to be very tied to nationalist studies, not only in England, but in other European countries. And nationalist studies were also the kin of um, imperial studies and colonialism. Uh -huh. So, um, as for example, um, and we had a very another keynote that talked a little bit about right, this the other day. Um, as missionaries, for example, would go in the 19th century to proselytize people in Hawaii, um, they compared Hawaiians to the savage people that needed to be Christianized in the 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th centuries. Um, that had been Christianized from uh, other places. Right. Um, and then, so their missionaries became a, like the missionaries who had, um, who had converted the, the people in England. It wasn't called many England. Many centuries ago. Yeah, many centuries I ago. See. So the past, uh, those pe the people of Anglo-Saxon England were considered kind of savage in, in a way that a, a 19th century person could say, that is our childish past. Um, we, it is our identity. We identify with that as our past, and so we keep it. But, but. we know that we have matured. Now, we are the grown-ups, and the people whom we are blessing with colonization are the ones who are going to be made to grow up. Yes, I mean, that is the history, unfortunately. Right. But and, now? Well, but now, um, fields, you know, all disciplines are working very hard, different disciplines at different paces, and of course, every discipline is, there's a very specific history um, as to how this played out. The identifications that were made, um, the very specific ways that these were attached to policies, mm -hmm. um, and the way that it fed back, because mm -hmm. the experiences that people would have, say here in Hawaii, um, uh, what we just heard that it, I, an islander uh, who had, and I'm, I don't remember his name unfortunately, that our first speaker spoke about, who um, had become himself a bishop, um, became a model for how people who were studying the Anglo-Saxon bishops um, talked about what that Anglo-Saxon bishop was like. So there's an interesting kind of circular uh, right. narrative that develops. So the, the, the people we study, that we call the people from Anglo-Saxon England, the name itself is problematic. I right? see. So what would be a more accurate name, though? Well, that's always the million-dollar question. Right. Right? And, and how does the conference 
um, put advance any of the issues or the scholarship in the field? How I know it just started. We're only in the second day. It's a right. five-day conference yeah. with how many people mm -hmm. from around the world? About 200, I believe. About 200, yeah. right. So do you uh, have a It sense? has been fabulous. Mm -hmm. So first of all, the call, the call for papers emphasized the place um, that this is being held in this place. The middle of the Pacific. Right. A to place study that was but, but specifically a place that was colonized. Um, right. and um, a, a place that will really push us to take a different perspective um, on our studies. And so that's the kind of papers that we're looking for um, for this conference. Mm -hmm. It wasn't the sort of thing where it was prescriptive, right? But this is the theme of the conference. And um, many people, some, there have been some wonderful papers, um, have worked hard to think about uh, the, what I just explained to you, um, that here we are with a discipline that has this history, to ask ourselves what is our responsibility and what can, what can be done with the material that we have to study um, that opens it up. But more importantly, how can we look at our materials differently? So instead of looking at it from a nationalistic perspective, um, there are, have been papers, for example, on England and Wales, um, because Wales was also colonized, right? It was uh -huh. also um, a, 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 on the fringe from way back, even, you know, many centuries before. So has it been ignored more Wales? up to now? Mm -hmm. Well, there are aficionados and there, there are small pockets, um, of pockets but it doesn't have anything like the resources or the attention, the the of course, under colonial, I don't want to say under colonialism because that's kind of a broad brush, but under the duress of a dominating power, mm -hmm. the, um, the language was suppressed, just similar histories um, right. as with Hawaii. Um, and the culture and the, the language. The, the culture, um, everything, everything. Um, so the question is going back, how do we rethink England and Wales and just think of them as separate entirely, right? Mm -hmm. So there have been papers opening out the history that was really a, his, a regional history that wasn't so separate. We call it now England, Ireland, Scotland, and Wales, you know? So thinking about regional histories, just cracking through all the boundaries, thinking about the texts that we have that actually are looking out across the world are not necessarily um, kind of monocentric. Um, so it, it's it's I, don't, I can't char characterize all of the papers, right. but well, there have been brilliant, brilliant mm -hmm. papers. Yeah, yeah. I know um, it's very impressive. I understand there are about seventy different papers that are going to be given. But I know you're speaking on Thursday, and we mm -hmm. mentioned is the mm -hmm. Jerry H. Bentley Memorial right. uh, keynote right. speaker, and of yeah. course it's very special to me since it was my late husband. Um, but your topic is, and I'm going to let you. Give us the name of your topic. Okay, the Archipelagos of Historiography. And how does this uh, fit into this overall theme of the globalization of the Anglo-Saxon mm -hmm. studies? Mm -hmm. So going with the idea of the connectedness of an archipelago as opposed to the remoteness mm -hmm. of an island, you mm -hmm. know, that rather than thinking of islands as isolated, mm -hmm. that thinking of archipelagos and connectedness um, I'm putting historiography with the archipelago because I want to emphasize the connectedness of histories across ah, the globe right. um, in several ways. One, less fortunate, and that is that the historiography, the writing of history, and the study of writings of history um, have, from Eurocentric perspectives, often, and, and were done through imperial eyes. I see. Right? Um, so, but the sun never sets in the British Empire, right? So, th in, in a sense that is today unfortunate, that we have those archipelagos of historiography. And then we could push against that the other way and imagine these connected histories by starting to do different kinds of historical work. Okay, well, I'm going to ask you to break for a second okay. and we'll get back to that right after the break. We'll be right back with our show uh, on the ISAS conference here in Hawaii with my guest, Dr. Kathleen Davis from the University of Rhode Island. We'll be right back.
This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. But grandmother, what big eyes you have. She said. What are you doing? Research says reading from birth accelerates our baby's brain development. Push. Ah! Read aloud 15 minutes. Every child, every parent, every day. Hello, I'm Helen Dora Hyden, the host of Voice of the Veteran, seen here live every Thursday afternoon at 1 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. As a fellow veteran and veterans advocate with over 23 years experience serving veterans, active duty, and family members, I hope to educate everyone on benefits and accessibility services by inviting professionals in the field to appear on the show. In addition, I hope to plan on inviting guest veterans to talk about their concerns and possibly offer solutions. As we navigate and work together through issues, we can all benefit. Please join me every Thursday at 1 p.m. for the Voice of the Veteran. Aloha! Welcome back. This is Carol Mon Lee on Global Connections with my guest, Dr. Kathleen Davis from the University of Rhode Island, who is here for a very important conference called the International Society of Anglo-Saxonists Biennial 2017 Meeting in Honolulu. And uh, Dr. Davis is one of the keynote speakers on Thursday. But let's talk a little bit about your own particular work in Rhode Island and uh, other places that you've been. I know you were at, uh, was it Princeton for mm -hmm. a while? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so my teaching? Yes, or? yes. Uh, yeah, your teaching, your writing, your research. Okay. So um, I'm generally a medievalist, so my teaching can be anything. I'm in the English department, so I teach literature. Um, so what are your so, classes, for instance, uh, during the semester? Is it? Um, I teach a sometimes Chaucer, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes um, an overview of medieval literature, which can include and go from, say, works from about 800 to about 1500, um, all different kinds. Um, I generally teach topics courses, so I get to pick, which is very nice. Um, my, more pertinent to what we're doing now are two classes. One is history of the English language, um, which can be taught in a, such a way, and this is what I do with it, um, to impress the students who are mainly going to be secondary education English teachers. Mm. Um, so it matters. <laughs> They're going out and um, in Providence, uh, where I am up in Rhode Island, um, they are going to be going into um, some minority neighborhoods because right. it's a city, right. Right? right? So I want to emphasize um, the global history of English, um, that it is an, a language that has um, dominated and its domination has a history that they need to be aware of. I also really, really emphasize that there is no um, standard English um, in a way that means this is the correct English, mm -hmm. but rather that a standard English is actually a language of privilege that comes with um, university education usually, or socioeconomic privilege. Mm -hmm. um, so they're the sorts of things I try to do. Um, but of course they learn the history in various, various other ways, going regional, back into the past, uh, regional dialogue, um, dialects, dialects and, mm -hmm. as well as going through the centuries and seeing actually how it's changed. And of course now, do you also cover how the changes in uh, whether it's the uh, internet technology, yes. slang, has, yes. has all evolved in, yes. in uh, emojis? Okay. Yes, so I started the last year when I, I started teaching the very first day we talked about emojis, uh -huh. which was a very, I've discovered a good way to start off that class that gets them going. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, let's talk about some of your publications. I know we have a, okay. let's pick uh, Ray, let's have a cover of one of um, Professor Davis's books. And this is called Medievalism in the Post-Colonial World. Right. And, and what is the sub? The idea of the Middle Ages outside Europe. Aha. Uh -huh. So it's medievalisms, plural, mm -hmm. um, in the post-colonial world. So I edited this uh, with Nadia Alcho, mm -hmm. a friend of mine, and she is from South America. She does medieval Spain. She works with medieval Spain, but more now on um, South American um, editing and reception of the idea of the Middle Ages, like what the idea of the Middle Ages, um, how it performed in the 
for example, the writing of South American history. Uh, there are many, many examples. That's one example of a medievalism in a post-colonial world. Mm -hmm. The world that was colonized, um, so all of the countries treated in the book um, were places that had been colonized by Europe. Mm -hmm. um, and what the idea of the Middle Ages did in the history of those people. Does it, I'm not sure if that's entirely making sense. Um, just as I said earlier, that people in Hawaii, for example, would be considered the savages who need to be converted, etc. Uh, but they would be labeled um, backward or medieval in many parts of the world. So, for example, in um, the South American, South American countries, um, the idea that the people were backward and living in the Middle Ages and had to get out of the Middle Ages was very powerful. I'm speaking of it in extremely general terms. Um, there are specifics of how that operated. So for example, the idea that um, Argentina was a feudal country um, and it needed to get over that feudal uh, right. organization. Modernize. And modernize. Now that may sound like, okay, well there, it's just language that's being used. But no, it has to do with the organization and the ownership of land it has to do with power structures. It has to do with rationalizing why um, one person should be able to be dominant rather than a group of people spreading the power out, which would be labeled in some, at sometimes feudal, mm -hmm. because it's like feudal lords, each having their own little fiefs. Mm -hmm. um, so the idea of things like the feudal or like the medieval um, were, were powerful rationales for um, manipulating power. Hmm. Um, and that can be traced in so many countries all around the world. So is this an ongoing area of study for you, uh, focusing on South America or? Well, it, Nadia focuses on South America. Right. Um, right. I, I mentioned that as an example. Right. I see. Um, my interest, which is more of the other book periodization. Okay, is, let's show the yeah. cover of the yeah. Next book. And both these were written, what, 2008, 2009? Um, this was published, published in 2008, I think, uh -huh. wasn't Medievalism. <laughs> I think the other book was edited, published in 2010. Aha. Uh -huh. Yeah. And you lose track after a while. <laughs> right. This is called The Periodization and, so Periodization Periodization and Sovereignty. Sovereignty. Yeah. Can you? How Ideas of Feudalism, where you can see my interest there, uh -huh. and Secularization Govern the Politics of Time. Aha. Uh -huh. And so. this book was met with great critical acclaim. Yeah, yeah, this is, thank you. Thank you very much. I was very um, impressed. Yes, so yeah. please tell us a little bit about this. Okay, so as I, as I started to realize the, the deep intertwining of medieval studies and colonialism um, and the work that the Middle Ages as a category was doing, um, because first of all, this is hard to explain to people, but the, the, uh, the Middle Ages, you have to kind of unthink that, right? That's just a category. It's a label that was put on a, a group of centuries o across Europe. Um, and it seems very innocent. But you really have to remember that it is a category that was produced at a certain, over a certain amount of time. It didn't just pop up all of a sudden, but in a shorter period of time than one would think. Um, and it did a lot of work. Just as I was saying, the idea of the feudal um, does work in, say, for example, South America. Um, I wanted to get at where did this come from? How is this so powerful? Mm -hmm. um, just let me try to figure out where it came from. And as I searched, I was searching the term, the Middle Ages, and, go, and other people had before me. There were various articles um, that tried, you know, just talked about where this comes from. And it was all very shallow. None of it was satisfactory. And I thought, you know what? It's what holds it together. What really holds this idea of the Middle Ages together? I thought, what are the real big categories? And I thought, well, feudalism, right? Middle Ages and feudalism, they're in just almost made to be identical. And um, very different secularization in the sense that if you, coming from something that Jerry, with when he called modern, modernocentrism, yes. um, people, uh, critics 
for many decades, all through the 20th century, so focused on what's the modern and what do you have to be to be modern. What do you have to be to be modern means not being what came before the modern, which would be the medieval, which would be the example of what not to be. Right. And that's another thing about colonialism is they were the people who were colonized saying, you have to be modern, you have to catch up, right? You're in the Middle Ages, catch up, catch up, get out. What do you have to be? Well, you have to not be religious, stuck in religious under theological oppression, right? You have to be secular. Now, of course, that meant a very specific thing, and it was always defined in such a way that no one outside Europe ever could really satisfy the requirements. Um, but the secular is something, as you can see today, mm -hmm. is driving a, a lot of um, very violent politics. Right. Will you get a chance to talk about your books uh, today at, this, at the conference? At the conference? Um, I don't know that I will. Mm -hmm. um, I, I want to focus on some particular things in the, in the talk um, that pays more attention to the relationship between um, an Anglo-Saxon past as it has been used and thinking about um, colonial histories. Okay. So it's implicit. The, right. the work of the book is implicit in what I will be talking about. Great. Yeah. Well, this has been so interesting. Dr. Well, Davis. thank you. And uh, there's so much to cover. Uh, I urge our audience to learn more about ISAS, I-S-A-S, the uh, International Society of Anglo-Saxons, and how it's so important for us as a global society to understand all parts of history in the world and by mm -hmm. bringing you coming to Hawaii it really has given us the opportunity to interact more and understand better so let's show one last slide which is the conference um, International Society of Anglo-Saxons 18th biennial meeting this week at UH Manoa uh, and on that note I'm going to thank you so much for coming today Dr. Davis. Well thank you for having me it's been a treat. Yeah. <laughs> Well, this brings us to the end of our show. Uh, we've enjoyed bringing it to you, and I'm your host, Carol Mon Lee, with our guest, Dr. Davis, from the University of Rhode Island. And we've been talking about the conference uh, and uh, look forward to having more scholars come to Hawaii and uh, share with us their different areas of interest. So thank you again, and on behalf of our staff, Grace Angalang, our production engineer, and Rob McLean, our floor manager, and all the others who contribute to our ThinkTech Productions, mahalo.